Hello, and welcome to Connecting Hawaii Business on ThinkTech Hawaii. My name is Kathleen Lee, owner of Kathleen Lee Consulting, and I am your host for this program. ThinkTech Hawaii is currently live streamed on thinktechhawaii.com, as well as on ThinkTech Hawaii's Facebook and YouTube pages. Viewers like you have the opportunity to ask us questions by emailing them to questions at thinktechhawaii.com. For today's show, we will be talking about criminal justice reform and business. Sorry about that pause there. Criminal justice reform and business and how justice advocacy and business are connected. On the show today, we have Representative Sonny Ganadin. He is the Hawaii State Representative for District 30, which includes Kalihikai, Sand Island, Hickam, Pearl Harbor, Ford Island, and Halava Valley Estate. So Representative Ganadin, welcome to the show. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me on here. Absolutely. So tell us, our viewers, about yourself. Give us a short bio or long, whichever way you want to go. Tell us about yourself. Well, I just finished my first legislative session here at the Hawaii State Capitol. Um, I ran before and lost, and I ran again and won. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of representing Lower Kalihi, portions of Palava, almost the entirety of Pearl Harbor. Um, I represent a community that has several thousand individuals who live in public housing. A lot of the first and second generation Filipino urban community in Honolulu. Um, a lot of issues facing the community, a lot of change. There's six stops of the rail station coming through there. The district also includes the Walton Community Correctional Center um, and a community that might be facing a lot of change, not just with the rail station, but with the changing of Aloha Stadium. So a lot of change in urban Honolulu in the next few years, and, and I hope to be a part of all of it. That's wonderful. Well, tell us a bit more about that as a, because you have been at the legislature before, um, but like the most recent session was you as a first time legislator. So tell us about um, your experience and what have you been working on? Oh, yeah. Well, I'd back into it a little bit. So I've, I've been a lawyer going on um, 12 years now, so mainly doing uh, criminal justice work. I was a staff attorney at the Domestic Violence Action Center. Uh, most recently, I was working with youth in Kalihi. I was a youth mentor and running a youth program at Kokua Kalihi Valley, working with mainly Pacific Islander young men and boys. Um, I'm half Filipino. My dad's a Filipino guy. I grew up on Guam. Mom is Mexican-American. They met at a disco. Um, all those experiences kind of helped me articulate some of the work that I'm doing now. In my first session, I'm grateful to have been appointed to be the Vice Chair of Corrections, Military, and Veterans Affairs. So in that capacity, talking about and learning a lot about criminal justice reform and some of the issues that are facing our community, some of the issues that are really coming to the fore nationally and internationally regarding racial justice, criminal justice, and the way those things intersect with business interests. Well, let's talk about that. What is your definition, our general definition? What is criminal justice reform? A lot of folks have been seeing in the news things like Black Lives Matter, so other things that have been um, being talked about internationally, really. Um, racial justice is a big issue. Last year, uh, last June, there were around 10,000 mainly young people that came to the Capitol during the middle of the pandemic to talk about racial justice. Um, it is at the forefront of a lot of people's minds. Civil Beat has been basically running a story uh, once a week on um, justice inequality. As a lawyer and as someone who was teaching in the Ethnic Studies Department at the University of Hawaii, I, I of course, I of course like learned about these things and started to teach them about um, the ways that the justice system has inequitably treated Indigenous peoples, um, people of color, and immigrants. Um, I know that there's a real connection between inequality, and access to justice, and the ability of individuals to, um, to be ambitious, to lead their best selves, and to pursue happiness. Um, a lot of people don't really see those connections, and, and I think that it's part of my job to, to try and make them. Um, First, I think we need to acknowledge that 
the criminal justice system inequitably treats uh, certain communities. So it's not just the African-American community um, that you hear a lot about in the news. Just yesterday, President Biden was in Tulsa, Oklahoma to discuss um, uh, the killing of um, members of the African-American community 100 years ago to celebrate the um, centennial of the Tulsa bombing and massacre um, in which the business community, African-American business communities were essentially raided by, um, by other white individuals of Tulsa. Um, of course, that kind of thing didn't happen here, um, but there is a disproportionate impact of the criminal justice system on certain communities. The Native Hawaiian Justice Task Force Report of 2012, which was delivered to the legislature, which I had an opportunity to help with, really discusses the disproportionate impact of the justice system, specifically on Native Hawaiians. And it talks about how that um, correlation um, goes back decades. And it's really unfortunate. If you are in this kind of business where you go to court pretty often, you, you see how many um, people of color and specifically Pacific Islanders interact with the justice system. So we'll be um, throughout the last year was really trying to track the ways that the Honolulu Police Department in particular were um, giving away those COVID mask citations. There was a real disproportionate impact on specifically the Micronesian community. Micronesians represented around 26% of those given those citations, even though they represent a far smaller percentage of the actual population in the city and county. So there is disproportionate policing here. There is disproportionate impact on certain communities. Um, charges for a criminal offense, even if it's minor, like a, a misdemeanor charge or a petty misdemeanor charge, those can really affect somebody who doesn't have high income. So um, you could lose your job, you could lose your transportation. Um, there are numerous instances of individuals who are held in OCCC here in here on Oahu uh, who just can't make bail. Uh, report three years ago by the ACLU of Hawaii notes that around half of the individuals who are at OCCC are uh, there simply because they can't afford to get out. They can't afford their bail. Um, so they're there pre-trial. Um, this affects all kinds of um, ways that we do business. We are a service-based economy. So if people can't make it back to work, and of course, it, it affects the whole chain up and down, um, which isn't. So I, I think that we need to differentiate um, this discussion about making an equitable justice system with the notion that you know people need to be held accountable for their actions. So, um, so those two things are are not incongruent, um, and they are definitely aligned with having a healthy economy where people's basic human rights are met, where they have enough food to eat, where they have, you know, um, the bottom tiers of Maslow's hierarchy of needs met, housing and food and, and, um, and basic shelter, um, crime is actually fairly low. And uh, for the folks that say, you know, um, certain communities need to assimilate and get better jobs and do these kinds of things, that of course is true. Um, Historically, the criminal justice system has been a barrier to that for certain communities. Um, this really uh, historically goes back to the, the history of the United States, the ways that, for example, in California, um, Asians were discriminated against uh, from getting certain jobs, um, the ways that uh, Japanese Americans were in fact interred, they lost their businesses. You know, like criminal justice is tied to um, the history of the United States, and it is tied to business. I think that uh, ensuring an equitable justice system, ensuring racial equality in our community, means that um, we have a more thriving and vibrant economy. I think that equal opportunity means that we each have an opportunity to see what we're good at. Um, you know, not everybody's good at business. You can make a terrible business decision, but I don't think that that should be um, say the criminal justice system or historic racism should get in the way of that. Some of the best inventions of the United States and of this community were created by immigrants, were created by people who are disproportionately affected by criminal justice. 
So making a better criminal justice system, making a safer criminal justice system is about business. It's about equality and it's about making the kind of future that, uh, that I think we believe in. Well, on that note, how do discussions on criminal justice reform affect your district, New York community specifically? So people have been talking about replacing OCCC for decades now. Um, and there's sort of a tentative plan by the governor to do that, to move the current site, which is 16 acres right in the heart of the district, on Gillingham Boulevard to a site in Halava. Um, part of the problem is we haven't figured out a way to ensure public safety while maintaining people's constitutional rights and doing bail reform. So about, like I mentioned, around half the folks at OCCC are just too poor to get out. So if we had a more effective pretrial system, then we could reduce the number of human beings that are currently incarcerated. That's not easy. So that means um, increasing bed space for mental health facilities, increasing opportunities for people to get help with addiction, um, increasing places for people to get help with mental health issues. And in addition to that, taking away the stigma of interacting with the criminal justice system. For a lot of folks, it's especially people of color, immigrants, there, there's because there's a disproportionate impact, um, that stigma of interacting with the criminal justice system, system when it stays on your record means that you can't get a little bit further in your career or in your life. So there, there's, there's quite a bit of work to do. Um, eventually, once we start to get a handle on these issues with the Department of Public Safety, with the prosecutor, um, working with the county and the federal government in articulating a better system forward, then hopefully we'll be moving OCCC. It's right in between two major rail stations. So it's going to be in between the uh, Middle Street Station, which is getting a lot of press, and hopefully the forthcoming Mokawea Station. So right there in the heart of that lower Kalihi neighborhood. Once that thing is replaced, you know, you've got the opportunity to do all kinds of things, build new housing, community centers, all kinds of stuff really an expansion of Honolulu. So instead of thinking of um, Honolulu as just like Honolulu proper, now we're gonna be thinking of Kalihi as a whole new part of the city. And trying to do that uh, without gentrifying while keeping people housed, all these things, it's, it's all connected to criminal justice. It's, but the first step is uh, making an equitable justice system, having a healthy conversation about what actually makes us safe, what, what actually makes a community prosperous. Um, I think coronavirus helps us realize that we're all really connected, that you know, my health is connected to your health, is connected to the health of the lowest paid essential worker. You know, the person at 7-Eleven could get you sick. Um, that means making sure that we are all healthy is, is, is a big deal. Um, making sure that we all have an equitable system is a big deal. So that was a lot, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I, gonna... I, just, I just started to rant on you. No, but that was great. Um, you touched upon it numerous times, and we are about to go on break in the next couple of minutes. But can you further expand on how business and racial justice are intertwined? You had mentioned California and the disproportionate number of um, certain folks that are incarcerated as opposed to the number the population of that particular community. Um, well, can you expand more on that like in a minute and then we'll go on break? Look, if you're a service worker and you have an interaction with the criminal justice system, you are innocent until proven guilty. So um, prior to um, your trial, you have to be found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Oftentimes people are jailed prior to that. When they are jailed, you could lose everything. You could lose your job. You could lose your housing. You could be in a cycle of interaction with the justice system. That really affects our service-based economy. So that's what I'm trying to get at. So it's not just for poor people. If you're also a business owner or even a major corporation, having people have negative interactions with the justice system when they don't need to um, is not a good thing. Thanks, Rep. Gannadin. Uh, we are going to go on a break, but when we return, we will be further discussing criminal justice reform and how it ties into business, especially in Hawaii. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Connecting Hawaii Business on Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Kathleen Lee, and our guest for the show is Representative Sunny Ganadin. We were talking about, before we went on break, we were talking about criminal justice reform and business and how the two are connected. Uh, Representative Ganadin, what are some challenges? Because you've earlier, you've identified some solutions. What are some challenges that you have observed in regards to criminal justice reform? Like, why are we, why do we seem to be stunted when it comes to moving forward um, on some of these things? Um, these are difficult issues. And many of us um, have been uh, victims of crime or our family members have been victims of crime, um, or we have seen um, other victims interact with the justice system. And so you, so it is kind of a natural human tendency to be punitive. Say you know somebody to live deserves a version of punishment, um, and and there's a place for that. Uh, but the thing is, uh, to make a more equitable justice system, you need to still have a jail, have a prison. We're in a democracy, um, but maintain people's constitutional rights and uh, and and make sure that um, that while you maintain the system, you um, uh, you maintain the constitution. I'd like to note that the Bill of Rights, it, it, it's mainly protecting the individual against the state. So the folks who created the United States Constitution, they, they kept in mind um, the notion of an overbearing, uh, mainly justice system. So the Fourth Amendment, which, um, which stops the government from doing an unreasonable search and seizure, um, that's an important one. The First Amendment, which allows uh, individuals, their freedom of speech, um, that that infringes the government. It doesn't infringe the individual. There's a lot of defenses of the individual against the overbearing state. Um, and so when you're a criminal justice attorney, uh, you, you see that often, that it's, that it's often the state that has to really come down, like oftentimes come down hard on something. And then it's, um, it's a defense attorney's job to defend the constitution even if they're not defending an individual um so so it's so it's almost as if the law itself is is created and civility is created in a way to um to promote our better angels our our better concepts of civility in a in a more just system and um and as attorney I, i've seen it a lot um and just as a human being and as a man of color of course i've interacted with the justice system in ways that uh, yeah, but, um, they weren't always pleasant. Um, I still work with kids. I still work with mainly um, uh, Micronesian kids uh, uh, off of Camp 4 Highway and uh, getting to know them and getting to know the issues that they face. It, it really um, um, opened up my eyes for the ways in which the justice system doesn't do all the things that, that, um, that we think it does. So a real big way to stop young men from interacting with the justice system is to have them interact with community and having them interact with others, especially if you're a young man of color from an immigrant community, um, having an after school program, having, um, um, having people that care about you, those are big, big deals. Those are, those are things that, uh, that stop you from uh, making bad decisions in life. And these are obvious things, you know? So for those of us that, do after school programs, those of us that have pushed baseball or ran track or done anything like that, you, you know that that these these kinds of things matter. And uh, so all of these interactions, hula practice, ukulele practice, it's all a, it's all in some way, I think, criminal justice reform. Promoting these things is is uh, making a more equitable and just society. Okay, we have a question from yeah. a viewer, but it almost seems kind of but okay, let me just ask it. It seems like Honolulu has become more dangerous in the last year. Do you agree? If so, what is the cause and the remedy? Um, the two-part question, I guess. Uh, well, the data is a little funny right now. So um, as of 2019, there was a bill that created a data justice center out of the Supreme Court so that we could have a more articulate conversation about whether or not crime is going up or going down. 
because a lot of us agree that we need to do criminal justice reform. So um, I don't have statistics in front of me, and so I don't, I don't want to articulate as to um, what went up or what went down. We do know that um, a lot of people were hungry, like quite literally hungry at the, around this time last year. Um, so there might have been an increase in property crimes or something like that. There's also just a decrease in humanity here on the island. Um, other things have gone down. Nationally, crime has gone down. Um, and so the justice system is, is sort of slowly reacting to that. Okay. Um, and what was the second part of the question? What is the cause and the remedy? I think you sort of covered it already when you talked about how people have been um, scarce when it comes to resources, right? Which, you know, may be a trigger as to why some people feel the need to, you know, commit crimes as much as they don't want to. I don't want to speak for everyone, but you, you kind of covered it. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. I mean, kind of a complicated response. Um, my big thing is, is youth interaction, interacting with kids. I'm trying to, trying to give kids opportunities to um, see how big and wonderful the world is outside of um, any interaction with the criminal justice. Well, that's very optimistic of you. So let me, let me follow that up with a, a similarly optimistic question. So how can we as a community contribute to the improvement of Hawaii's criminal justice system? Um, there's a lot of things in the news lately. So I think Civil Beat is doing a great job of following up with, um, for example, what's happening with the Honolulu Police Department, um, the prospective reforms that I think should have happened after um, the Kealoha incidences from just a few years ago. I think that if that would have happened in another city, there would have been a whole suite of reforms that would have happened at the prosecutors and, and the the county police departments, and, and I'm not sure um, we're ever going to get there. I also think that um, you should care that we still have a state contract with private prisons. We still um, have around a thousand individuals, mainly Native Hawaiian men, that are housed in Arizona. Um, I think it's something of a barbaric practice, and that um, the state should be starting to create a plan to end that practice the same way Texas and New York and California have. With your focus on uh, criminal justice reform, what is one lesson that you have learned that you can share with our community and our viewers out there? Um, the Big word that I learned and started to use last year when I was working with kids was longitudinal. So um, like following human beings from in a study from kind of youth through um, through adulthood. And what they found was um, for a lot of kids who were considered at risk um, um, in these longitudinal studies, uh, the biggest thing was having an adult that was persistent in their lives. So that could be anybody. Um, if you know of a young person that um, um, that might be making questionable decisions, whether or not a family member of yours or not, um, just be persistent in their lives. You don't know how um, how much that matters to youth, and um, and I think that is criminal justice reform. It's the little individual human steps that we can make, especially in young people's lives. Um, I try to do that here and there. Um, I, I think that um, there's thousands of people in our community that do it, softball coaches and hula instructors that are just in young people's lives and they're doing wonderful work. And knowing that and following people throughout their lives, um, knowing that people make mistakes and for the most part, um, they should be forgiven and they should be allowed to engage with our economy and our world um, after those mistakes are paid in full is an important lesson to know. Is there anything else that you would like to add that we didn't cover? Um, just that I'm grateful to be here to continue to interact with these issues. They're tough. You know, a lot of us know that criminal justice reform is it's tough. It's it's hard to talk about um, uh, criminal justice reform without thinking that, you know, I know somebody who was um, a victim of crime or like, you know, my car got broken into or, you know, or all these like horrific things that happen to people or horrific things that human beings can inflict upon each other. But also knowing that there is a statistical difference 
for certain communities, and here, Pacific Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander communities. There, there's historically a difference in the way the criminal justice system treats them um, and us, and, and, uh, and acknowledging that and moving towards a more equitable justice system makes a better world, a safer world, and I think a more prosperous one. It, it's good for business. If people would like to continue this discussion with you, or if they want to reach out, how do they go about and do that? Um, I'm easy to find. I can't hide anymore. <laughs> I guess I'm a public person. I'm getting used to that. Uh, so I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, just go on the website and email me or um, or call the office. Um, also, just uh, pay attention to what's happening in the news. There's, there's really interesting conversations um, at the Honolulu Police Commission. And there's going to be really interesting conversations in the next year, in the next two years, with the Hawaii Criminal Justice Oversight Commission. We just, I'm very happy to note that the that the state just paid um, for them to be fully funded so that um, an oversight commission consisting mainly of former judges, people who worked in public safety, former police officers, will be interacting with the justice system to make it more equitable. So um, um, just, just pay attention, you know, it's your democracy, it's your tax dollars, you should know how these things work. Thank you for that. And on that note, we will be wrapping up our show. But Representative Sonny Ganadin, we thank you for joining us today to talk about criminal justice reform and how business are intertwined. Again, my name is Kathleen Lee. We thank Jay Fidel and the staff over at Think Tech Hawaii for making shows like this possible. We had Melissa and the staff helping us out today. So until next time, aloha. <laughs>